Hello viewers, I'm Dennis Orere. Welcome to another edition of Business PNG. In this edition, we continue our focus on the Medang SME Summit. The summit closed earlier this month with strong sentiments, a deliberate push for protectionist policies to be created. These recommended policies seek the creation of an incubating space to be made for Papua New Guinean businesses. But are we attacking the problem with the right solution? This is the question that the Papua New Guinea Business Council brings to the table. Tonight, we speak with the Council's Executive Director, Doveri Hanau, on the Council's stand with regards to the Medang Declaration and Communique. Mr. Hanau gives an analysis of the 21-point Communique. He is Martin Namorong with the interview. Good evening, viewers. Tonight on Business PNG, we have Doveri Henao, the Executive Director of the Papua New Guinea Business Council. Doveri is a lawyer by profession and has previously worked with the Pacific Islands Forum and the University of Papua New Guinea Law School. Doveri, welcome to Business PNG. Thank you, Martin. We're here to discuss the recent Papua New Guinea uh, Indigenous Business Summit that was held in Medang recently. Mm -hmm. And it came up with a 21 pay, uh, point Communique, which highlighted some 560 million kina worth of shopping list about how we can improve small businesses in Papua New Guinea. What is the businesses, Business Council's perception about the Communique? Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, well, first of all, um, just to put the Communique in some perspective, the 21 um, recommendations uh, could be divided into four areas. The, the first area is the entrepreneurial training, the capacity of um, uh, uh, building um, an entrepreneurial class, whether it's through schools or through the technical and vocational centers. The second component is then looking at various institutions, um, such as the National Development Bank, and also the private financial institutions in providing a, a capital market or accessing capital for businesses. So there is a, a, a financial fiscal framework that's been proposed. And then the third one looks at a, a protectionary framework for small, medium enterprise businesses. Um, key to that is the component of um, looking at uh, in, in instances of removing dummy companies. Um, and the other more striking feature of that is the reserve list in identifying various sectors. Yeah, in, in, in relation to the reserve list in particular, the PNG Business Council obviously represents a broad spectrum of the uh, business community. And what is the council's view about perhaps the discriminatory nature of the reserve list? Yeah. Well, I, I'll get to that point uh, later on, uh, but, but just completing my previous um, observation, the final one is the relevant entity on, um, on, on administering and facilitating the, um, the outcomes of, um, of the Medang Communique. Uh, at the end of the day, the intention of government to formulate policy in uh, Proving Papua New Guineans to make them actively participate um, in the economic activities in this country is something that the Business Council supports wholeheartedly. Um, and the four issues that I've mentioned is a critical aspect of driving that reality and that vision the government and also the private sector shares. And just answer uh, um, the, the question that you just stated on the reserve list. There are elements of that that do require further analysis, further opinions, further consultations, so that we do have a set of frameworks that are ideal for, for, for the country to progress on. Um, unfortunately, that is where the difficulty in some of those, in most of those issues that came out of Medang, there hasn't been uh, um, uh, a, um, a, a reference point or a desire to look at further analysis. Uh, because if you're dealing with commercial and economic policy, it's highly quantitative. It, de it does require surveys. It does require a fair bit of analysis until you can come to a point 
um, where you can make those decisions. And more importantly, there is a rules-based system that do exist internationally that we have to conform to. So to answer your question about the reserve list, um, the, the, the rules-based system that are under various international laws do provide a framework in determining what sectors should be uh, closed, what sectors should be open. Um, and that rules-based uh, framework, this is where we have to look at um, uh, causations or linkages that d determine whether a PNG business is in fact uh, injured from imports or injured from the presence of foreign services. When that injury does occur, then the appropriate remedy should apply. Um, but again, these sorts of technical questions and the rules that, that we're talking about cannot be answered unless there is that first reference point, that first instance of analysis and studies. Unfortunately, for those 21 recommendations, there's only two that indicate review and analysis. And, and given the fact that enormous amount of money is involved in this, what do you think, the what sort of next steps should the government be taking? Um, you highlighted analysis, what sort of uh, work that needs to be done to create this uh, intellectual body of knowledge that can back the recommendations or perhaps chuck them out if they are, un un are not commercially viable? Yeah, <clears throat> exactly. Th there needs to be a body of literature that has to be established. And for us to move into that direction, um, the four areas that um, the, um, the communique had highlighted, well, the four areas that I'm categorizing uh, on, uh, on education uh, of, of entrepreneurs, on, on the areas of uh, financial capital available for businesses, uh, enforcement and protection of SMEs, and the last one of a government entity to, to coordinate these issues. Uh, those are the four areas that need refinement, they need uh, conversations, they need discussions. And before we can attach uh, resources on them, uh, they still have to go through that refinement process. And that, I think that's where the, the commencement, the starting point should be. Stay tuned. Our interview continues when we come back. In this segment, Mr. Hennau talks about the essence of basic business and financial literacy for SME operators in their various journeys of entrepreneurialism. He also touches on the legal aspects of the Medang Declaration Communique for businesses. Given the, once again, I'm going to highlight the amount of money that's involved. Yep. It's, a, it's a substantial portion of the government budget, about 560 million in the list that, that's come out. Given the fact that entrepreneurs, yes, they're Papua New Guineans, but they're going to be a minority of the general population, is it justifiable that a few people get a large chunk of the national wealth, you know, just to feel some sort of ideological, you know, view that somehow Papua New Guineans have to get into business? <clears throat> uh, you're right that um, um, this, uh, uh, this particular relationship uh, on, on, on um, being an entrepreneur, participating in the economy, it, it's not for everyone. It's, it's for a certain class of people that would have prerequisites. And, and, and one of those prerequisites is basic business literacy, financial literacy. Uh, secondly, there is a, and that's something that uh, culturally perhaps we, we're not akin to having. So those that do have access to that um, appreciation of uh, business and financial literacy would, would naturally be readily available to participate. Um, is the, um, the amount that's been quoted in the forum uh, justifiable for, for those participating? I, I don't have an opinion on that, um, primarily because uh, a, a substantive amount of that uh, resource, um, if we were to look at the 560 million in some perspective, it goes towards um, the opportunity of uh, having access to capital um, under the National Development Bank, which is where the proposal of um, 
most of that money is. And, and for any business to access capital, is, it's, it's good. The only challenge is, do you have the business capability, the business appreciation on fully utilizing that capital? So I, 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 I think that's where the issue is. The business literacy aspect will not render um, entrepreneurs or budding entrepreneurs to fully utilize the source of that capital. Given the issues that have come out of this uh, discussion that we're having and need for more analytical um, studies being done about this issue being highlighted, would you think that if the communique being passed by parliament or endorsed by parliament as is, what sort of impact would that have you know, on business in general in Papua New Guinea? Well, well a, a, strictly speaking from a, um, um, from a um, sequencing point of view and, and, and the, the legal nature of a communique, it, it's, it's a statement of intention. It's not a, an act of parliament. It certainly isn't anything binding. So it's a direction that the government and, and some people in Papua New Guinea have indicated what they think an SME process should look like. Um, whether Parliament approves it or not, um, uh, it's, it's perhaps immaterial. The critical part is those 21 recommendations and what will the government agencies, what will the leaders do with those 21 recommendations. Uh, certainly from the perspective of the Business Council, we do want to maintain consultations and that is the, the reference point. If, if that is truly where the government wants to go, um, there are a couple of things that have to happen first for both us, government and other stakeholders to appreciate the content of what this policy and this legal direction is. Uh, for example, um, the 21 recommendations have, seven of them are law reform activities, either create new laws or uh, tweak existing laws. The other is a mixture of policy on uh, creating new policy or tweaking existing policy. Uh, all of those sorts of directions, they do require analysis. They do require some form of opinion that can be consulted for further refinement. The, the, I think the, the critical thing to also understand is um, the, the, the business community do appreciate uh, more participation of Papua New Guineans. If, if we can reduce our reliance in our supply and value chains from bringing imports in and we can source them in Papua New Guinea at an affordable rate, that would be the first preference. Um, but again, in order to have that sort of conversation, prerequisites have to be in place. Do people understand the context of a commercial relationship? Uh, does the infrastructure allow us to source materials? Um, is there a healthy taxation regime that allows businesses to interact? And then the more critical thing, is the regulatory environment sufficient enough to protect these transactions? So there's a lot of internal issues that uh, stack up that do require the focus. Up next, the interview looks at the proposed Malaysian model for SMEs in PNG and the controlling of businesses in the country. If you've just joined us, you're watching Business PNG. About 90% of the formal sector is under foreign control and ownership. This was one of the issues continuously being raised during the summit. In this segment, we look at this imbalance. Mr. Hena also speaks on the proposal to adopt the Malaysian model of SMEs. In highlighting that need for perhaps some sort of external advice, the summit itself talked about the Mal a Malaysian model of uh, affirmative action towards uh, indigenous populations um, and that I suppose is the theme behind the summit itself. Given what you highlighted about governance regulatory issues um, and Papua New Guinea's own history of how um, there has been political interference in distribution of uh, funds 
uh, allocated for such activities in previous years. How, how do you see things playing out? Should the recommendations be uh, impl implemented as is? <clears throat> well, again, I, I come back to the, that original point. Um, the, when, when any conversation on commercial policy is being discussed in any context, whether it's in SMEs or, or taxation, um, it, it's highly technical, it's highly quantitative, and we need to get to a point of looking at a single document that indicates to us this is the direction we want to move in, in, in taxation or, or in growth of the SMEs. That hasn't occurred. Um, uh, c coming back to your point about uh, um, the Malaysian model and, and on affirmative action, from my reading of the communique, the, the reference to Malaysia was on a diagnostic toolkit, and whether that diagnostic toolkit can have some residence in the policy making of SMEs. Um, again, uh, it's it's a highly, um, uh, I'm, I'm assuming a highly complex policy machinery that we all need to talk about, we all need to have some perspective on, and at the moment, um, that hasn't transpired. So c coming back to that point, uh, c can we really talk about a Malaysian model? Um, like personally, I I'd like to look at other models on uh, promoting knowledge-based industries. Now, the, the success stories in, in Korea and Japan on their innovative and creative sectors, uh, those are also interesting models that SMEs and even businesses generally can, can look at. And obviously we wouldn't be having this conversation had it not been for the reality that over 90% of businesses in Papua New Guinea or economic activity is not uh, Papua New Guinean controlled, uh, indigenous Papua New Guinean controlled. And understanding <coughs> that, what, 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 what are some things you see that create this situation that we are in? It's a good point. I, I don't have a specific answer. Um, and. Again, uh, I, I'm I'm also a bit weary on your 90% statistics, so, um, so so that's something that um, you know can be debated later. But to to answer your question on um, on uh, the majority of Papua New Guineans not engaging in um, in business and entrepreneurial activities, it it, it comes back to that point on um, financial and business literacy. Uh, this is a relationship, it's an engagement where you're dealing with um, uh, um, a body of information that's dynamic. Um, you're, you're dealing with holding money, reinvesting money, uh, stocks, capital, staff. So the, the plethora of issues in business that's been dealt with, um, it does require um, some form of literacy. Um, people talk about entrepreneurial cultures that exist in societies that do lean on understanding business. Um, unfortunately, our society, in, in most cases, our, our communal societies do not talk about individualism. They, they do not promote the idea of uh, economic-based rights. So that therein lies the first problem. The second component which affects businesses, and, and not just um, the majority of uh, Papua New Guineans, but even the larger corporates. Um, you know, uh, from our friends from the mining to the extractive uh, sectors, it, it's infrastructure. Uh, how could we get the materials pro removed, processed, and shipped? And, and it's the same problem on supply chains. How could we get the farmers' uh, products from the mountainous parts of our country into the markets domestically or export them. So those sorts of issues um, are horizontal and, and they do impact uh, generally why people can't participate in business. And I think the third one is um, accessing capital, accessing finance. Um, if the uh, if the market is conservative, if the market has, the financial market looks through the lens of 
a very um, um, a very structured way of accessing capital, then there are only going to be few people accessing capital. And you do need extra capital. You can't rely on your profits to grow your business. Our discussion continues right after the break. Welcome back. In this last segment, Mr. Henao responds to the proposal for a reserve list for PNG businesses and business training for Papua New Guineans. So given the fact that the issues surrounding why Papua New Guineans are not being able to participate in business are much more complex, should the government create a list of reserve businesses for Papua New Guineans, what impact would that have on general conduct of business and the economy of Papua New Guinea? Yeah. <clears throat> Again, it has to be looked in strategic aspects of business. The, as I mentioned, the main reason why a lot of our friends are not participating in, in, in businesses is that, is that area of business literacy, it's that area of infrastructure, and it's also in that area of capitalization. Now, everything that I'm saying, elements of that are captured in the communique that there is effort being made by the government in addressing it. Um, will the reserve list assist in those three challenges that businesses face, and, and more so the SMEs? The, the answer perhaps is not conclusive. And, um, and the reason for that is a, a, um, we're targeting the wrong um, subject matter to, to address the problem. Um, business literacy is not given to foreign businesses exclusively. Um, business literacy is something that the government should put resources in to train our people. The, the government has also um, gone out of its way. Uh, my organization uh, put together a, a business forum earlier this year, which this show um, uh, had uh, great coverage on. Um, thank you. <laughs> the, the, that particular forum was on infrastructure, time for action. And, and again, we saw that government is going uh, um, full steam ahead to develop infrastructure. So, so there are elements being resolved. Um, is the reserve list going to enhance uh, um, business literacy, infrastructure, and, uh, and access to capital? The answer simply is no. Um, another great danger that um, the, the reserve list poses, many of the inputs that businesses currently use are not from Papua New Guinea. And, and, and those inputs vary from physical pieces of equipment to human resource and even <coughs> virtual equipment as well. If we were to impose um, reserve listing on the particular sectors that uh, were discussed in Medang, um, there is generally going to be a problem in accessing those materials if the materials have to be domestically sourced, which is a, which is a, um, a particular recommendation that came out on national content. Um, I think the other third area w which um, uh, it's, uh, it's, again, it's debatable, but it's also important to highlight to to the viewers, is that the reserve list also imposes um, uh, particular challenges on commitments that we've made internationally on liberalizing aspects of our economy. Um, for example, in the World Trade Organization commitments we did in 1995, uh, a portion of our sectors were open up. And if we are to close those sectors, there is a legal process that we have to undergo to close that. Uh, in Geneva, in the WTO. Um, some of the other agreements that we've signed up with the European Union, and quite recently negotiating with Australia and New Zealand under PESA, um, <clears throat> those are the sorts of arrangements that we have to think of in the larger context. Um, if we're not able to look at it from a perspective of um, um, uh, both inwardly and also outwardly, there is the danger that um, it may disrupt not only internal business,
but also the ability for us to attract foreign investment and on a more wider scale, our foreign relations as well. Doveri Hanau, thank you for joining us on Business PNG. Pleasure, Martin. Thank you. And that winds up this edition of Business PNG. To access our programs online, log on to www.mtv.com.pg. Also, remember to send us your feedback via Facebook or email. I'm Dennis Orere. See you next Tuesday.